Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, welcome. Um, it may be morning for some of you, depending on where in the country you are. So uh, we're delighted that you're here. Um, if you are not already on mute, please do so. Uh, we are recording this workshop today. So um, if you also don't want to be seen on camera, then please also um, just turn off your camera. Please use the chat for anything that you have a question about or um, you want to just chime in with a thought, then that is there for you as well. And I'd like you just to find the hands up button. So um, I'm gonna be trying to get a little bit of uh, interaction going. So I'm not sure, I don't even know where mine is to be honest. So I would have to go and find um, the little hand that you're putting your hand up or clapping whatever you want to do there when I'm asking for some interaction, that's going to be the best way to do it because there is going to be a fairly large group here today. So welcome to you all. Um, I first want to start off with a land acknowledgement. So we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work, live and play on the treaty lands and territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg and the neutral First Nations people. Uh, where I live, it's in Paris, Ontario, along the beautiful Grand River that uh, with running through these downtowns, so if you've never been here, um, you are more than welcome. It's a lovely little town, and we are very grateful to the original peoples who um, lived on this land, allowing us to enjoy it. So it is May. It's Mental Health Awareness Month. So we wanted to bring to you a workshop today that you could really that we could really focus on mental health in the workplace. Uh, health, psychological health and safety is a subject that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, in my role at Gowan, not only do I need to pay attention and care for my team, but I also regrettably hear so many stories of workplaces that are not feeling psychologically safe for workers and for my clients. I am the clinical lead for our trauma program, and we receive between 10 and 12 referrals a month from the WSIB Mental Health Specialty Program, the Mental Health Injury Program. This tends to be a population of public safety personnel, including corrections officers, OPP, first responders of all kinds, uh, firefighters, paramedics, as well as transit workers, and many other types of occupations where the workers gone off work due to a workplace trauma. I most often hear that had the employer been more responsive, more empathetic, more caring, the worker experience would have been vastly different. And on a personal level, I also want to work in an environment where I, it's safe to speak up, where my team feels supported, and so do I. We've already kind of covered this off, but during the presentation, I will ask that you mute your microphone and allow everyone to hear the presentation. If you have a question, use the chat box and send it to us. I do hope there will be times for Q&A at the end. And uh, Nicolette is going to be helping me out just with fielding those, those um, questions at the end. So the objectives for today are we're really wanting to look at the who, the what, the why, um, and the how. So my goal is that after our session today, if you don't already know who Gowan Consulting is and what we do here, that you will know after today. And the phone will start ringing off the hook with inquiries for referrals tomorrow. So the why, um, why do we need to consider psychological health and safety? We're gonna cover that off. And I'm gonna ask for a little bit of participation from you on that one. The what. So what is the national standard for psychological health and safety? And I'm also going to go over what it's not. The benefits of implementing a, a psychological health and safety management system within your workplace. And then a little bit of the how to, what does that really look like? So the who. I think many of you already know that we are Gowan Consulting. Um, how many of you have used our services either by coming to our training program or having referred one of your employees to our programs, to our OT services? Can you put a hands up in the, put your hand up if it's, if you have used, I don't know where it is. I can't find mine on my, my screen. Anybody else not have a hands up? Oh, there we go. Two people are raising their hands. Thank you. 
So honestly, is there like 56 people who've never heard of Gowan Consulting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure many of you have because um, we, we, we do recognize some of your names here that are as a participant. So I've only got two hands up if you already are familiar with our services. If you're not, welcome, even, even a bigger welcome. I'm just going to admit everybody, there's 35 people in the weight room. My goodness. Okay. How does that happen? Sorry. I'll get them all here. I probably need somebody from the Gowan internal team to help me with the weight room and admitting people. If you can, please, that would be great if anybody can do that for me. All right. So. Occup Gowan Consulting, we are an occupational therapy provider specializing in disability management. Oh, sorry, I'm just, you know what, give me a second. I'm just going to make sure everybody is here that is trying to get in. Somebody is in the chat. I'm still admitting people, folks. Sorry about that. Um, I am trying to keep an eye on a gazillion things here at once. So there we go. All right. So my question was, how many of you are familiar already with Gowan uh, Consulting, either through referring a worker or a manager or through one of our training programs? If you can go to the reactions box and Put your hand up. I've got four, five, six, seven, so many of you already. Great. So for those of you who don't know, we are a women-owned occupational therapy service business. We were founded back in 1999 by Nancy Gowan, um, starting off with a vision to, she saw a gap in services. She saw a need for occupational therapy within workplace settings. and. Um, has really grown the business since 1999 to the present. And now we are Canada wide. Um, we have an in house uh, staff of about 20, but then we have around 100 occupational therapists on a subcontract basis with us, coast to coast to coast. We offer services all across the board in disability management. So everything from ergonomics, accommodation assessments, and interventions. We really want to focus on stay at work and return to work. Mental health support, as we all know, is growing and the need is growing and um, we just uh, we just have to keep continuing to add <laughs> our resources for mental health, mental health support. We do offer training programs like this. Um, they're not always uh, freebies. Today is a, is a gift to you to celebrate Mental Health Month and for those of you in our membership program. Um, the other big piece of what we have started doing and we're doing more of now is we're being asked to look at policy development for large companies and large organizations as well. We've just finished a rather major project or we're still in the process of wrapping that up um, with a large health provider, healthcare provider in uh, Ontario. And that is looking at a complete SWOT analysis of their entire disability management program. What's working, what's not working, all their policies, all their benefits, and we have been able to go back to them with some great strategies on how to just really um, tune that up a little bit and, and improve their the services that they're offering their workers. So why do we need to talk about psychological health and safety in the workplace? When I've done this workshop in person, it's an opportunity for the audience to engage <laughs> um, online. I wonder if you could use the chat and just throw out one or two words about why you think we need to be dealing and talking about and focusing on psychological health and safety in the workplace. I'll give you one second to do that while I make sure everybody is here. So please go ahead, chat away. I want to see that engagement. Why do you think? What are some of the reasons we need to focus on it? Yes. Integral, so I can, everybody reading the chat and go back. Oh, now you're all typing really quickly. <laughs> That's lovely. Integral to health and workplace culture and productivity. Yes, leads to mental health absences, which are leading cause of absence. Yes. 
health and engagement of our team, absolutely. Staff engagement retention, sustainability of return to work. It's equally as important as physical health, absolutely. To give support for mental health, to build trust, collaboration, innovation, engagement culture, provides a holistic approach to health and safety. These are great. Growing trends in cognitive claims. Oh, interesting. I'd like to talk to with you a little more about that one. Um, are you able to make me co-host so I can let people in, Emily? I will try. Let me find you here. That would be lovely. If I can have a helper, it would be great. Just need to find you, Emily, one second. Emily, I only have an option of making you either host or I don't know if I can make you co-host. It doesn't give me that option. I'm afraid if I give you host, then um, I lose control. And I'm a control freak. So I'm going to hang on to it. Uh, I'll just try and deal with it here at my end. <clears throat> so lots of ideas here. Thank you very much for, for participating there. Um, helping employees manage symptoms and maintain relationships, benefits to stay at work programs and recovery. All great, great, great ideas. Thank you. Nobody said cost. Cost is a big factor in why we should be looking at, it's not the only factor for sure, but it's definitely a big factor in why we should be looking at psychological health and safety in the workplace. So I'm a little surprised that that wasn't the first thing that came up. So there are some other ideas. We're going to talk a little bit about financial cost of mental illness on our global economy and in our workplaces. And we're also going to cover off some other whys. The psychological health and safety is an important part of how people interact with one another on a daily basis. It's estimated that, uh, that adults spend majority of their waking hours on the job. Two, a research study showed that two thirds of Canadians spend more than 60% of their time at work. As much as our health is primarily our own responsibility, our physical health, our mental health, yes, it's our own responsibility. There are many factors external to the workplace that can impact our mental health. The workplace then can, can and does play a significant role in our ability to manage both our physical and our psychological health. Work can be a source of well-being and opportunity to be productive and contribute to society. It can also be a source of stress that leads to poor mental health or make all those life issues that we deal with on a daily basis just a whole lot worse. Done right, work can be a refuge for workers during difficult times. And done wrong, those life stressors just get a whole lot bigger when you're coming to work and that's a stressful environment for you too. Research also shows that teams that have a high degree of psychological safety are the highest performing teams, the most inclusive teams, and then the teams that people really want to be a part of. And at the end of the day, it's just the right thing to do. Here's some numbers. These are these are stark. These are these are um, mind blowing to me. Um, I'm just gonna do one more quick second. I want to make sure that everybody's here. It looks like everyone that wanted to join us is here. So. Emily, if that's not the case, please chat with me again and I will go back and find that. So costs, let's talk a little bit about the financial impact here. There was a 2020 survey that was done um, looking at global trends. Um, the Global Medical Trends Survey done in 2020 showed that um, the global cost, global economic losses related to mental health disorders between 2011 and 2030 are estimated to be 16. $3 trillion. This is compar comparable to the cost of cardiovascular disease treatment and higher than actually the cost of cancer, chronic respiratory illness and disease and disability and diabetes. So it's a little earth shattering that mental health is costing globally that much money. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health, so CAMH, estimated that the mental health, the mental illness economic burden to Canada is approximately $51 billion per year, with $6.3 billion of that loss resulting from lost productivity. They're estimating that by 2041, the cost of poor mental health 
to the Canadian economy will exceed $2.5 trillion. Not just, it's not just a Canadian problem. The UK also found that lost productivity and employment from depression was 23 times higher than the cost of treatment of that disease. Workplace mental health, not just workplace mental health, but mental health in general makes up about one third of our STD and LTD claims, but 70% of the workplace disability cost. And then each week, CAMH showed that approximately 500,000 Canadians miss work each week due to mental health illness. Oops, sorry, I just jumped something here. There's no sign really of anything improving either. So another the same CAMH study in 2022 looked at increases in mental health and symptoms and anxiety reported. So you can see here from this slide that since July 2021, so this was mid pandemic to now to this was January of 2022, um, the anxiety levels increased, reported anxiety levels increased from 19% to 25%. Depression increased from 18% to 22%. Loneliness reported from 18.8 to 24%. I found this one interesting, the binge drinking level decreased from 26% to 25%. So I'm not quite sure how they defined binge drinking. Um, I feel like binge drinking used to be something you did on the weekend and you overdid it. Um, and now I, I wonder if people are just drinking a lot on a consistent basis, because I'm not hearing any concerns from the LCBO that they are down revenues or anything like that. So I, I found that an interesting statistic. I would have thought that that would have gone up. Cost of doing nothing. There's some hidden costs that are tapped that are um, related to mental health. Things like absenteeism, lost productivity, your disability claim numbers injuries, grievances, high turnover, and potential risk, uh, legal risk, if the employer is not taking care of psychological health and safety in the workplace. And we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute too. All right, I'm just gonna look at the chat quickly. The cost of doing nothing, here was another study uh, from 2020, mental health research, for a typical organization with 2,000 employees or more, here are some of the costs that you could be looking at if we're doing nothing in terms of mental health awareness and mental health support. Absenteeism, three million bucks. We're looking at perceived bullying, still getting bullying in the workplace. And we do see it at Gallon. We get some referrals for people who do not want to return to the workplace because of bullying and harassment. Presenteeism, 24, almost $25 million. People showing up at work and then just being a little bit in a vegetative state and they're not being able to focus and concentrate and be productive. They're there, but they're not really working. Oh my goodness, we still have nine in the waiting room. Sorry, folks. <clears throat> my apologies to those of you who were sitting in the waiting room. Um, I'm trying to multitask here and keep an eye on that as well as do the slide presentation. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so big costs, right? So the cost of doing nothing in Canada to an employee of 20, to an employer of 22,000 people or more, $37.8 million. Those are US bucks back there, but we couldn't find a slide with Canadian dollars, but picture loonies and toonies and behind that 37.8 million, a lot of money. So cost, big factor in why we should be looking at health and safety, psychological health and safety in the workplace. Recruitment and retention challenges. What kinds of issues are you facing right now in your workplace? We can either do a hands up or put it in the chat. What kinds of issues are you finding that you're running into with re recruitment and retention? Staff shortages, yes. Thanks, Hazel. How many of you, lack of qualified applicants? Right, <clears throat> exactly. Resilience, high desire for remote work, yeah. I really kind of got used to that during COVID. Now we want it more. Any others? Difficulty finding the right person for the job? 
Anybody having that one? So recruitment and retention challenges, we're seeing it in every industry across the board, right? Restaurants to healthcare, um, everybody, every employer I think is, is having challenges with recruitment. <clears throat> High turnover is another one as well. And there's some reasons for that and I can show you a slide on that coming up in a minute. So let's look at our worker pool for a minute. In 2022, um, workers on average, and I think at most times, not just unique to 2022, but workers on average uh, eight, range between the age of 20 to 64. Baby boomers right now are between the age of 59 and 77. So they're starting to exit the workforce. Some of them want to stick around a little longer and keep working because work is valuable to them and they still feel like they have lots to give and to share. Um, but on average, like we're seeing that drop off um, at, at, at between, after 59, we're seeing a bit of a drop off. So they're dropping out of the work pool. The, millenn the Gen Xers are our big workforce right now, as well as millennials. So the millennials are age uh, 27 to 42 are considered millennials. 43 to 58 are considered the Gen Xers. The up and coming workforce are Gen Zs. They're right now age 11 to 26. So the bulk of our workforce being Gen X and millennials with Gen Z coming up in the future. So that's a population we wanna focus on. This is gonna be our core work group. The next couple of slides are gonna be on what is it that they're looking for in a workplace and what's gonna keep them there in terms of psychological health and safety. Pretty interesting studies that um, I came across in preparing for this. So what is it that millennials and Gen Zers are wanting from an employer? What's gonna keep them working with us? Study done by Deloitte Global in 2022 are showing that the top reasons for leaving a job between Gen Z and millennials are not being paid enough. And I think that's pretty clear. Our economy is just so ridiculous right now. The Gen Zers and millennials are struggling. They're struggling to buy a house. They're struggling to get out of their parents' basement. Still in the top three was their feeling that their job was detrimental to their mental health. And that's why they would leave. So it looks like a small percentage there, but it still landed in the top three reasons for leaving. And feeling burnt out. So there's burnout is still an issue. I thought it was an 80s thing, but clearly the research that we're seeing is still showing that burnout is very alive and well. Three top reasons Gen Zs and millennials choose a new job. They were looking for a good work-life balance. So that comment about looking to work remotely, looking for flexible hours, looking for that four day work week, learning and development. They want to feel like there's opportunities then for growth, for learning, for in, in going up that so-called corporate ladder that I just even wonder if it even exists anymore. And then top reasons for choosing a, a new job was also higher salary and benefits. So no surprise there, can we let Mackenzie Kelly, sorry, yes, there's still three people in the weight room. My goodness. <laughs> sorry, those of you who are in the weight room. Um, I'm trying to pay attention to three different screens here and wasn't looking at you. So welcome. We are recording this uh, workshop today, so you'll be able to go back and review it later. Please chat with me if you see anybody else in the weight room and I can add them in. Thank you for that. Burnout, still an issue. I, um, again, was a little bit surprised to find this, that 46% of Gen Z, 45% of millennials feel like they're burnt out due to work intensity. 44% of Gen Z and 43% of millennials recently left an organization due to burnout. And then 20% of Gen Z and 25% of millennials do not believe that their employers are taking burnout seriously. That again is a bit of a shock to me, but um, it's, it's what the survey is showing. And I'm gonna take that as face value. Deloitte also found that half of the workers surveyed agreed that these days organizations are talking more about mental health. They are, there's talk about it, there's attention to it. Um, but it's not really resulting in any meaningful impact on, on their employees. 
And also they found that workers are still not comfortable discussing mental health issues at work or accessing the support put in place by the employer. Um, do you guys know what your uptake is on your EAP programs? Um, do you know if people are accessing their extended healthcare benefits to go and have some counseling and support? A third of Gen, uh, one third of Gen Z and millennials said that they would not be comfortable speaking openly with their direct manager about any mental health issues that they're having. So they're keeping it to themselves. They're there, they're burning out, but they're not speaking up about it. So very much a hidden kind of disability um, because there's still a bit of a stigma attached to talking about mental health. We're not quite there in our society yet where it's perfectly acceptable and seen as just as easy to talk about as a broken leg. There was another survey done by Great West Life in 2012. This is a little bit older one, but that one showed even then 70% of Canadian employees were concerned about psychological health and safety in their workplace. 50% reported frustration and exhaustion. 65% of managers said that dealing with conflict in the workplace was the most stressful part of their job. So that's the why. The cost, retention, recruitment, the right thing to do. We're seeing what Gen Zers and millennials are wanting in the workplace. So if we want to hire good people, if we want to keep good people, um, we do need to be looking at our psychological health and safety programs within our organizations. So we're on to the what. What is the national standard and what is it not? The national standard is a Canadian standard. It was created in 2013, so it's fairly new. Um, it is the first standard of its kind internationally. So Canada was definitely the leading edge of creating a national standard for psychological health and safety. The standard, it's voluntary, it's not a mandatory, it's not a regulation, it's not a law, it's a guide, and it provides a framework around some key objectives and principles for workplaces to look at. Um, it's a model that you can use to refer to when you're creating your health and safety uh, processes and protocols and policies and procedures at work to include psychology. It does provide some outlines on how to set up the program or what they call a management system within the, the standard. And again, it's not a regulation or legislation. And I'm gonna say yet, um, because next slide shows that even though it's not, it's voluntary and has no legal force, it is predicted to have an impact because it provides a definition of psychological health and safety. And it provides an employer with a framework for a system. So as much as we have all these other legislations that as work employers, we need to look at and consider, create our policies and procedures around, um, we, we don't have to put in a management system for psychological health and safety at work, but in a legal context, if you don't and somebody's going off work because of bullying, harassment, mental stress, because of workplace issues, then it could become a legal issue for you as an employer. So there was an article by Dr. Martin Shane. Um, there was an article he wrote called Tracking the Perfect Legal Storm. And I put that in, in the resources at the end. Um, he talks about emerging case law, increasingly holding employers responsible for providing psychological safe workplaces. It's no longer sort of something good to do and nice to do. It's becoming a bit of a legal imperative. So the standard was created based on these seven fields of law. Um, things like occupational health and safety law, where the employer needs to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of the worker, including psychology, psychological wellness. The act includes anti-harassment provisions, other provisions specifically aimed at psychological safety. Employment contract law, where there implies a requirement for the safe system of work. Labor law, breach of collective agreements, existing arbitration has deemed collective agreements to include the Occupational Health and Safety Act and deemed that mental health is part of that definition. And tort law, if you do have a good solid psychological safety program in place at work, um, you can use that as a, a defense against any potential claim of negligence against the employer for any um, mental health issues that people are having and go to court for. And human rights, protection from discrimination, employment standards, 
WSIB law, all of it, right? Privacy legislation all ties into psychological health and safety as well. Okay, so the standard talks about pillars of a psychological health and safety management system. I'm gonna shut my chat down here for a second. So the, psycho the, the standard has a definition in it. Um, and the definition that they use is that psychological health and safe workplace is a workplace that promotes workers' psychological well-being and actively works to prevent harm to worker psychological health, including in negligent, reckless, or intentional ways. So the standard goes over three basic pillars of psychological management system programs. So when you're creating a program within your own workplace, these are the three pillars you might want to start with. You want to help prevent psychological harm from workplace conditions. You want to promote psychological health by supporting your workers in the workplace. And clearly, we need to help resolve any incidents or issues that rise that are risks to our employees. And those would be things like harassment and bullying that, that we can mitigate and do something about, hopefully. The standard provides us with five key elements to the framework. So the first one being just commitment from leadership, commitment from your entire organization, top down all the way from your senior leaders to your middle managers, to your actual employees and participation in that program. They talk about having a plan, um, any, any organization, if you're trying to pull off a goal or you're trying to create a new program, you need a plan for how to do that. Uh, then implementation, evaluation, corrective action, and management review and continual improvement. The standard doesn't actually tell you how to do each of those little pieces. There is a handbook that goes along with the standard. If you go and you, you Google the standard, there's also a handbook. The handbook gets a little more detail on each of those five frameworks that you want to start looking at within your organization. So first part is le le commitment and leadership. Most of you probably already have some kind of strategy in place, or you would have some kind of policy in place, at least to have a policy in place about harassment and bullying. Um, but before you start, if you haven't got a program or you're wanting to revisit your program to just see where it sits in terms of quality and is it effective, be sure that you've got everybody that you need on your team. Everybody else needs to be on the same path as you are. You need a commitment from senior management, like I said. You want to have a commitment to develop a systematic approach for managing psychological health and safety. Doesn't mean you can't do it without that senior leadership commitment, but it sure helps. You want to have a policy in place that outlines your organization's commitment to the development of a good program. That policy can just even be a one pager just to say that, you know, an umbrella kind of statement that that shows your staff and your whole team and your all your employees that you are committed to ensuring that psychological health and safety is in place in your workplace. Okay. So senior leadership needs, needs to be on board. Um, it, from what I have seen um, in terms of my work as a disability manager and OT working in the workplace settings, middle management needs to be on board to make anything work. Sometimes that's where we see the biggest issues and challenges as the middle management are not supportive of their, their staff. Um, their staff don't feel comfortable going to tell them what's going on. They don't feel comfortable sharing um, information with them. So if you don't have that trust and support and champions with your middle managers, then the employees are not going to want to participate. But you definitely need participation of all stakeholders to make this work. Um, I have some notes here from my previous workshop that don't apply to this one because the last one was in person. So pardon me. Um, yeah, so leadership at all levels play a role and everybody at work, I, I think, is a leader. So leaders should work actively to support, encourage, engage all stakeholders and all stages in the decision points in designing your program. The next, the next kind of main area to look at is planning. 
So like any good program and goal, planning is necessary to establish objectives and targets. You're more likely develop, to develop an effective strategy or implementation plan if you have a good understanding of where your organization already stands. You want to establish a baseline by doing a good full 360 assessment of your current program. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are the hazards? What are the threats? What are the opportunities? So a SWOT analysis of any of where you're already at can be very helpful. A psychological hazard, identifying those, what are those psychological hazards can take many forms. Is it trauma, exposure to constant trauma? And that is, oh, I'll get another, hang on. Um, so uh, the, the program that we run at Gowan is a trauma-based program um, through WSIB Mental um, Specialty Injury Program. Um, mental stress injury program. And we deal mostly with first responders in that program that, that they're dealing with trauma after trauma after trauma. So, and that that is one of their psychological hazards. Um, there was some research done recently that we learned that paramedics, for example, their work life expectancy in that occupation is five to eight years. Um, and they just, they just quit because of the, the trauma exposure. Chronic stress can be a psychological hazard, emotional abuse, bullying, harassment. And we see it. We hear it at Gowan. We're often getting referrals now for sensitivity training for managers whose behavior is having a negative impact on the workers. Um, we want to create plans that also meet those legal compliance issues for all the other legal um, legislation regulations that we just covered over. You want to assess your worker health impact, the financial impact, and the organizational policy and process that promotes good psychological health. Create a vision for what psychological health and safety looks like in your organization, and then establish goals for reaching that vision. But definitely you want to start with doing a bit of a SWOT analysis of your existing strategy. The national standard gives us 14 different factors to assess when you're looking at your program. So whether you're starting from scratch or whether you have a program in place and you want to just do a good evaluation of it, these are the different kind of factors within your workplace that you want to start assessing. So as you embark on your journey, you want to assess where you're at. The handbook is also very helpful to explain what each of these things are. Whoops, sorry. Uh, we're going to just touch on each of them quickly um, because I don't have enough time to go through each one in detail. But if any of you want another workshop on um, breaking any of these down into more detail, uh, we can certainly look at doing something like that. Or if you want just some custom help with, with your own organization, looking at your SWOT analysis, we can do that. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly and then spend a little more time on um, just the, the, the piece of psychological uh, and social support and the psychological protection piece. Organizational culture. How are you doing with your culture? What supports are already in place? Do you have a culture and a work environment that's characterized by trust, honesty, and fairness? Our first responder group will tell you that they don't feel like they can trust their coworkers or their managers um, in, in being able to be vulnerable enough to share that they are having a mental health issue. So they stay at work stoic. They find other ways to cope. Their work and their organizational culture is not necessarily supporting them to um, be well and to stay at work in a psychological health and, and safe way. Growth and development. Remember what the Gen Zers and Millennials are looking for. 30% of them want that learning and development opportunity within their workplace. So does your workplace um, encourage and support development in interpersonal, emotional, and job skills? Recognition and reward. We're looking for a work environment. There was appropriate acknowledgement and appreciation of our efforts in a fair and timely manner. Work-life balance, 30 to 40% of those millennials and Gen Zers are looking to jobs that allow for work-life balance. This isn't new. A study published back in 2014 with aging workers showed that they also want flexible work schedules and reduced work hours. 
are we really allowing for those work-life balance um, priorities that our workers are asking for? Are we addressing the Gen Z millennials, older workers need for work-life balance truly? Workload management, are our workloads reasonable and sustainable? Studies are still showing that burnout is real. We're hearing in the media how overworked healthcare workers are feeling. We're hearing from restaurants how they're struggling with hiring. If they're always operating short-staffed, then the people who are showing up are overwhelmed. Sorry, there is somebody still in the wait room. <laughs> Clear leadership. Our workers are wanting a good psychological health and safety workplace would include a work environment where there's effective leadership, support that helps employees know what they need to do, uh, how their work contributes to the organization, and whether there are any big changes coming. No surprises. Don't surprise your team. That's not always helpful, and they can feel just very vulnerable and insecure. Involvement and influence, a worker wants to feel like they can be included in discussions about how their work is done, how important decisions are made. And somebody said earlier, our physical safety, um, I think employees, employers have done a pretty good job of this. Uh, I, I feel like the um, priority of of physical safety at work has, has been there for quite some time and the psychological safety, like I said, the standard just came out in 2013, so it's pretty new um, and we're getting there. Civility and respect, a work environment where employees are respectful, considerate and how they interact with one another, as well as with customers, clients and the public. Do we know what the psychological demands of the job is? Do we know what the interpersonal and emotional competencies require to fit in with the, that job? How stressful are the work tasks? How cognitively demanding are they? Are your teams dealing with difficult and angry people all day long? Do they have the resilience and support to be able to manage that kind of chronic workplace stress? Engagement, a work environment where employees feel connected to their work and are motivated to do their job well is something to look at when you're assessing your programs as they exist. Psychological protection from violence, bullying and harassment. This should just be a given. Um, I, we are always surprised at Gowan how often we're still hearing um, some of the stories from workplaces that are not um, protecting their worker from the bullying and harassment should be zero tolerance. If you become aware of what's going on um, as an HR person, any of you on uh, from HR on the on the call, those are the people you want to um, to really be weeding out. And then all the other chronic stressors. It's not possible to list every possible factor that could affect psychological health and safety. So the standard just um, adds this one in as like sort of that. Uh, and other duties as assigned kind of comment. Um, so other chronic stressors as identified by the worker. The area I'm gonna spend a little more time on, just the psychological support piece. Um, so a psychological supportive workplace is an environment where coworkers and supervisors are supportive of the employee's psychological mental health concerns and respond appropriately as needed. This is a good place to start. Do your leaders have necessary training? Have they taken the manager mental health training program through Gowan? Do they know what to look for and how to identify when some one of their workers is struggling? Do they know what questions to ask when someone is in trouble? Do you know what a worker would say constitutes a psychologically safe workplace? I'm thinking that this will be a topic that we can probably expand on in future conferences and workshops. Um, but just what are those questions to ask? What are the things you want to notice? Has there been a change in behavior? Are you noticing somebody just really withdrawn or coming in late or not showing up, calling in sick more often? Those would be some of your flags to look at. So all of those 12 things, the kind of data you want to start 14 things, sorry. The data you want to start collecting um, to really assess your programs that you have in place. 
or if you're starting a new program, look at your existing policies, look at job descriptions, update your PDAs, your physical demands assessments, and your CDAs, which are your cognitive demands assessments. Look at all your aggregate data. What are your absenteeism numbers showing you? What are your turnover numbers showing you? What is your return to work and accommodation data showing you? What are your STD, LTD kind of costs and what are those claims looking like? What are your WSIB costs and claims for mental health? Any incident reports? I always encourage doing exit interview results so that you can really look at why are people leaving to get a full understanding of what was behind their, their res resignation. How well do we provide our support through EAP counseling programs and doing worker surveys can be really, really helpful. There are a number of leader surveys out there that you can just ask your leaders to do. At Gowan, we just did one recently with our leadership team. We all had to complete um, an assessment of ourselves and how well do we understand what psychological health and safety is at work um, so that we can be sure that we're also taking care of the teams that report to us. Okay, let me just see through my notes. Um, okay. One of the one of the things that I find um, really interesting with some of the extended healthcare benefit packages that are out there, um, most of them, and I, I don't know about you guys, but the ones that I see with with my with my clients that I work with and my family particularly, um, they the OPA the Ontario Psychological Association recommended rate for counseling is two hundred and twenty dollars per hour. And when we have extended health care plans that max out at $500 per discipline per year, you've got two sessions for psychological health and health and wellness. Um, it's not enough. So if you're doing anything when you're looking at some of your reviews of your programs, go in and have a look at what those benefit packages are and are they sufficient? Is there another way of delivering those mental health support systems? Um, with enough money to su really support your worker. Okay. What I will tell you is that what I hear is an OT, um, workplace culture, perceived lack of support, insufficient time in between exposures for trauma with my trauma population um, are all factors in their disability and barriers for return to work. We also see transit drivers who've been assaulted, um, which is just ongoing risks that we can't really mitigate. We can't stop that from happening. Um, it does seem to be more and more frequent. So I don't know what we can do within, with, with those transit drivers to help make their workplace safer for them. When you're doing worker surveys, um, you, want to, you want to make sure that those are confidential. Somehow do them so that they can be done anonymously. Employees don't think that you get it, that we get it as employers. We're still seeing those high rates of burnout. Um, we see a lot of referrals and increased referrals that are tagged as complex. Um, we had a 63% of our files that came in in March this year were considered to be complex. Um, so how are your workers doing? How would they rank your workplace culture and safety? Um, the surveys, um, so the guarding minds at work, and I've got that in also in one of the, the resources. Um, oh, somebody, I, I don't know who this is, but uh, somebody in the chat has said, physical barriers installed on buses for COVID have significantly reduced assault by passengers. Absolutely. I, I think every bus and train should have that physical barrier um, when you've got potential for aggressive and angry people. You're right. So COVID did, did something good, right? <laughs> Thanks for that. I think it's Irene. Um, so the other resource to go and look at Guarding Minds at Work website has an employee survey that can give you an initial scan, um, but if you can create your own survey as well, that would be really helpful. One of the things we did at Gowan when we were doing the full um, SWOT analysis for our, our healthcare facility um, was we did focus groups with the employees. So we had an external person, um, somebody from Gowan. Uh, sat with groups of the employees and just chatted about what did they want to see, what was their challenges, where did they see things that they wanted to improve. They opened up so beautifully and it was really neat and we were able to kind of give all that feedback back to their employer without revealing who had said what. 
So really helpful practice there. And, I, and it was just a great exercise. Uh, so offering an anonymous survey that asks questions about company culture, psychological health and safety, and what they want to see improved. Um, you want to make sure that it's confidential. The focus groups were brilliant. We had a group of, we, we maximized out to seven people per group so that there was an opportunity for everybody to, to share and feel comfortable doing so. And just remember, people are not open to speaking openly with your direct manager. So you want to make sure that those surveys are done um, without necessarily the manager being the one to sit in around a table with their workers to say, what do you think? So then you want to go and do your data analysis review. Start thinking about what are the underlying reasons and causes for the trends that you're seeing. Group your information um, by strengths of your existing system and opportunities where you can see um, improvement. Hilda, yes, nurses are routinely assaulted. One recently lost her pregnancy to patient assaults. Yeah, yeah. It's still happening um, rather horrifically, right? Okay. So yes, employers are talking more openly and offering resources to support well-being doesn't seem to be enough to encourage the disclosure from your employees. Disclosure relies on the environment created by the leader and the manager where people feel safe to disclose and talk without feeling judged or having any repercussions. So then the next stage in the standard in terms of implementation and creating your program, um, you want to make sure you've got enough resources to implement the plan. That could be financial resources, manpower resources, time resources, um, just so that you can actually really do a good deep dive into what's working, what's not working, and where do you need to fill the gaps in. You want to identify champions on your team who can be the leader at every level of the organization. So champions within the, within the, the actual teams, the, those, um, the actual workers, champions within your leadership teams or middle managers and then champions within your senior executive uh, so that you've got everybody who can advocate for the program support the program be role models for the program and live and breathe what your what your goal is and what your mission is around this you want them to be equipped with knowledge authority and ability so make sure that if you're asking for a middle manager to be your champion on the team, that you've armed them with knowledge and information and training. Education, education, education. Like just, we want everybody to understand what mental health can look like, what good mental health can look like in the workplace and when you're, and to be able to identify when your employee is struggling. So education, awareness and communication is key training that all of your leaders will need. And your employees doesn't hurt to train them either, because often employees can pick up on what's happening with their coworker, or they'll notice that Johnny um, is acting a little odd, or he's not himself. And then he can that person can also be a support to your employee. Preventing and eliminating hazards. This is not always easy to do. You can't always eliminate those hazards because we don't have control sometimes over human behavior. But once we know about it, you need to step in and take action. Training, again, we've talked about having an incident reporting process that is easy, that doesn't um, rat anybody out, that doesn't throw anybody under the bus um, and, and can be done in a very safe way. Offer resources to workers who are experiencing those mental health difficulties. Um, again, all the managed mental health training that we do at Gowan can be really, really helpful just as a starting point as well to train up your managers to know what to look for and how to help. Keep in mind employees who don't feel safe at work won't talk. Um, especially I, I hear about police officers who still have the whole stigma. They, they feel shame. They feel embarrassment. They get teased. They actually get teased by coworkers if they're struggling with mental health issues after a trauma event or exposure. You're not seen as strong if you're not. Um, you're not seen as strong or competent if you don't hold it together. Um, I think a lot of us OTs at Gowan have heard this phrase. I don't want to be seen as the wounded bird. 
Um, we hear our first responders not wanting to go back to work because they don't want to be perceived as the wounded bird. So interesting that that is an issue for them. Okay. I'm just going to pass on this one. So the key, yeah, the key to successful implementation, again, is commitment and leadership, having good policies and procedures, employee engagement and participation. So that's basically the standard in a nutshell. That, that is the framework that they give you when, you. when you go and download the standard, it shows you all of those different things to look at, factors to consider, things you want to assess. Um, doesn't really dive into the real life um, psychological health and safety in the workplace. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes on that. Um, this workshop does go till, till uh, 1.30, I thought. So we, we still have a bit of time here. Okay. So what is psychological safety really? Um, Amy Edmonston is a researcher on psychological safety, and she's actually written a book. And recently there was a paper published um, that uh, talked about a little her philosophy and her understanding of what psychological safety at work really is. So in her view, it is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. She says that psychological safety is not always warm and fuzzy. This is not my cat, it's somebody else's cat, but it's a cute cat. This is a very warm and fuzzy cat. Work doesn't always feel like that. It is present when employees feel like they're part of an environment where challenge, conflict, and mistakes are valued. Learning is a team sport. Possibility of failure that comes up with taking a risk doesn't always feel good, which is what holds people back. Um. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through my notes. You, so a psychological health and safety at work is also the ability to have conflict, to go around the table and go, okay, these are all great views. Who's got a different perspective on it? And that person with a whole different idea has the safety and the comfort to speak up without feeling that they're stupid or being reprimanded. You want to be able to experiment and fail without repercussion. This is where you're going to get um, just some creative thinking going, some great brainstorming going. Um, feeling safe to show up authentically. And um, I, I shared this a little bit with our team last week that being authentic at work doesn't mean that if you're, and pardon me, I, I can't see any of you laughing, but we, we all giggled about this. But if you're a jerk, don't show up at work as being a jerk. That's not what authenticity is about. You know, if you're a big old grump at home, you don't necessarily want to show up as a big old grump at work all the time. Show up authentically, but you also want to be kind. You also want to be considerate of other people's feelings and how your actions are being perceived by others and how you're making them feel. Being vulnerable, taking risks, and talking openly about your weaknesses also is a good sign that you've got some good psychological safety at work. It used to be taboo to talk about how you were feeling at work. Being professional, back in the day when I started my career, you didn't bring any issues from home to the workplace. You were stoic, you got the job done, you were quiet, you didn't say, oh, I'm not having a great day. I'm not at my best day. My kid was up throwing up all night. It wasn't okay to talk about being burnt out. You just grunt. I really had to just go and deal with that. Things are changing. I think we've seen from our millennials, from our Gen Zers, they're wanting a workplace that says it's okay to say I'm not at my best today. Amy Edmonston, that, that psychological researcher, um, also in one of her writings, uh, talked about teams that are, are that are generally not psychologically safe. Teams are generally not psychologically safe unless we've intentionally put practice into place. So using the framework from the national standard, putting those policies in place, they don't just happen naturally. People don't just speak up as freely as they should without it becoming truly okay to do so. 
It isn't about the absence of things going wrong, but rather the absence of the fear of negative consequences when things do go wrong. At Gowan, now what we're going to do as a leadership team, just to be the role models for this, is as leaders, when we have had an error or we've discovered a mistake, um, we're going to start collecting the stories about the oopses. We share at Gowan every day our wins on our, we have a Teams chat and an office huddle and on there it's like, hey, I've got a win for the day, whether it's personal, whether it's professional, whether it's something great that happened with the client, some great feedback we got. We're quite comfortable going in there and putting our wins on the chat. We're not as comfortable going in and putting our oopses on the chat. So as a leadership team at Gowan, that's something we're really going to be focusing on in the next little bit. So for our team members who are on the call today, um, get get ready. You're going to start to see some of the mistakes that your leader your leaders are making and how we have resolved them um, to get it to a point where it's okay that that our team can trust that it's okay to speak up. So the leader's role. You're all leaders here. We want to lead by example. Admit your mistakes. Apologize and put a plan in place to correct it. Model that vulnerability and speak up. Allow others to be vulnerable and speak up without repercussion or humiliation. Be clear and kind. Um, the other thing we've done at Gowan that might be something you guys would be interested in is uh, as a leadership team and, and we included our the rest of our team on some of the chapters was we were reading together through Brene Brown's Dare to Lead book. And in there, we talked a lot about courageous conversations, how to be clear, how to be kind. Um, I often talk to my OTs when I'm coaching them about having a strong back, so being firm with, with the people we're working with, but also having a soft front. Um, and I think I stole that from Brene Brown too. So having a strong back and a soft front allows you to be uh, supportive, but also to be pretty firm on, on what the goals are and the expectations. Give and receive feedback in a clear and kind way. So just learning how to do that communication is very key. Respecting others. Again, authenticity doesn't mean you have no filter. You want to be careful. You want to make sure that um, you don't demean others under the guise of being authentic. Are you sharing something that is affecting somebody else's psychological well being or cognitive capacity? Are you disclosing <clears throat> a vulnerability um, to try and connect with employees? Or are you working through personal issues that may be better reserved for friends and family? Okay to share, but oversharing is a fine line, right? The key is to share with intention. As OTs, we are pretty much told by our college not to share much in the way of personal uh, stories. But the key, the sharing with intention, I find is really helpful is, is a way that I think about it. If I have a story in my own personal life that can help one of my clients go through their journey and can use my lessons learned, as they learn theirs, then that's sharing with intention. I'm telling the story with a significant purpose in mind. So again, the workplace community and your desire to be authentic doesn't supersede other people's rights to feel comfortable. So as you're going through this, keep in mind, it's a journey, it's a process. The key is to start somewhere, it's not a race. You can implement the standard over time a little bit by little bit. Um, something that stuck with me a couple of weeks ago was a comment that met, that said the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time to plant a tree is today. So start somewhere, get going. If you don't already have a good plan in place. So the benefits of implementing, implementing a psychological health and safety management plan, it's really good for employees. It's the right thing to do. We've talked about the good business sense in terms of cost, recruitment, retention, productivity. It can reduce absenteeism. You can see reduced STD and LTD claims, improved turnover rates, reduced turnover rates. You don't want, to, you don't want those rates to go up. Um, reduced complaints and grievances related to conflict in the workplace and increased employee health, engagement and productivity. There is that neuroleadership article that I was mentioning um, by Amy Edmonston uh, talked about without a climate of psychological safety, things like collaboration, innovation, engagement, and virtually every other behavior affecting 
uh, performance can suffer. Suffer. We know when people feel safe speaking up, um, there are significant impacts for leadership and diversity, equity, and inclusion objectives. So what are your next steps? First of all, you can download the standard, go online, it's there. You just Google Canadian standard for psychological health and safety in the workplace. You're gonna review where you're at with your organization, do that good full SWOT analysis, a 360 review of all those 14 factors. Are you able to articulate what is psychological health and what psychological health and safety means in your organization? Is everybody clear on that? Do you have leadership commitment? Have you considered confidentiality, diversity, inclusion? Do you have all these stakeholders participating and engaged? Do you have a good policy? Is there a plan? Have you called Gowan to help you out? So here's how we can help. Gowan can help with your SWOT, your policy review and plan creation. We offer man manager mental health training, both in groups, one-on-one. -on -one. We can offer customized programs to your organization if you want to do specific training for your group. We can do accommodation assessments by occupational therapists. So these are where we would meet with your worker. We would look at their work demands, look at their what they're struggling with, uh, especially for those hidden disabilities. Um, we can definitely come in and, and do a full evaluation of where they're at, what they're struggling with, and make some recommendations back to you as employers to help you kind of keep them at work safely and return them to work. We offer OT-based psychotherapy treatment. Um, for those of you who don't know, occupational therapists now have um, the, the uh, designated act of the controlled act of psychotherapy within our wheelhouse. Most of our OTs at Gowan do have training in CBT, DBT, ACT, and various other uh, psychology modalities. Um, and we are, we are very well equipped to work with any of your workers who are struggling with mental health issues. We're also cheaper than that $220 an hour OPA rate. We can offer success coaching to individuals and teams to address those unhelpful behaviors, the communication, emotion, regulation, organization, stress management. And definitely our training programs are all there. We've got many of them online. We are revamping them and bringing them up to date and cleaning them up a little bit. So watch for those new and shiny uh, programs coming up. Uh, this is the list of all the online workshops and training that we have coming up. So office ergonomics, uh, something coming up in June and again, October. Um, inclusive psychological safe leadership that's coming up in September, trauma informed support for return to work, October ish, CDA certification program that's your cognitive demands assessment program is we have that ongoing um, mental health return to work accommodations in the workplace. So many things that you and your organization can take full advantage of. And just go to www.gowanhealth.com and you can see all of our offerings there. And then the next slide is just our references and resources that we use to create this slideshow and presentation. So I know it's only 109. I, I probably talked way too fast. <laughs> Um, and not having any um, audience engagement is a little tricky as well. So um, you, you can either buy back some time or if you want, if you have a burning question, go on unmute and feel free to ask away. Um, this is just a page that you will see in your handouts. There, there was a handout uh, that went with the link for the meeting. Um, that is the PDF for the slideshow. So um, you have those contact resources for you if you need to reach out to anybody here at Gowan 